Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speak speaker is Matthew Nisley. Matthew Nisley is a teaching fellow in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. His research explores the history of forager landscapes in Eastern Africa, drawing on historical archaeology, political ecology, and science and technology studies. He is also interested in the Anthropocene, industrial food systems, and invasive species. Please join me in welcoming Matthew as he gives his talk, The Usandawe Petroglyphs, New Perspectives on Tanzania's Rock Art Archive. Thank you, everybody. It's good to see uh, some of you again, and I also uh, see some new names. This grew out of <clears throat> uh, the fieldwork that I did over uh, the last few years for my dissertation. And uh, one sort of funny thing about how this came together is that I decided to start small. And when I, I decided to start small, and focus on the petroglyphs because when I was beginning, I thought that there were two petroglyph sites uh, that we recorded during my fieldwork, but we actually recorded six. And uh, as I'll talk about in the paper, the reason that I didn't realize that we had recorded six is because I uh, had a particular idea of what could or should count as a petroglyph. And once I started thinking about it, I realized that the number expanded. Uh, quite a bit. And um, I started digging into it and and started to realize that Tanzania actually has quite a lot of petroglyphs, even though uh, most folks who have commented on it in the literature have mentioned that it has very few. But um, so it started as a very small project and then kind of quick, quickly ballooned. Uh, but this talk was a really good uh, excuse to uh, revisit that and try to get it finished up. So we can jump in. So as a little bit of background, what I thought I would do today uh, is I'll sort of break the conversation into four pieces. So the first is just give a general introduction uh, about my uh, dissertation work uh, and ongoing research in the Sundawe homeland. Then what I'll do is I'll jump right into uh, the site descriptions. And I actually uh, only have five listed here, but there are six. Uh, and then what I'll do is move into a conversation of some of the larger uh, issues that I'm that I think that these sites allow us to begin talking about. So one is I'll briefly go over uh, some of the debates that I've uh, been introduced to uh, concerning how to define petroglyphs. I also want to talk a little bit about um, rock art studies in Tanzania and uh, some of the the traditions and and particular kinds of focus that that work has had. Then what I'd like to do is talk about some of the spatial trends that I saw uh, in terms of the distribution of petroglyphs. And then in the end, I want to briefly uh, discuss uh, how I've been uh, rethinking some of the questions in uh, rock art studies in this part of the world, and especially the emphasis on on things like authorship. And I want to talk briefly about how I think um, other kinds of approaches, like landscape approaches, which uh, think about the sites uh, within their context, sort of spatial context, but also cultural context, to the extent that we can infer that if the sites are not actively being used, uh, provide uh, perspectives on uh, these sites and their histories that other kinds of approaches don't necessarily allow us to have. So, uh, and one of the reasons that I think it was really good to be asked to give this talk is because it sort of forced me to articulate um, exactly what it is that I am trying to say here. So first and foremost, as I already mentioned, uh, Tanzania has more petroglyph sites than previously recognized, and not just by a little, by a lot. So some of the, there are really only two uh, synthetic analyses of the rock art in across Tanzania. And both of those date to the, the mid-1980s. And both of them mention that Tanzania 
has about five petroglyph sites. But as I'll point out later, uh, I think that there are at least 59 known petroglyph sites in Tanzania and about a dozen more that have been reported, but about which we don't really have good information. And if you, I actually have to, I have to look at the exact number on the chart uh, when we get to it in just a moment. But um, uh, even if you want to focus on petroglyphs that are uh, uh, figurative, that is seem to be representing uh, a particular idea, such as a you know a, a figure of a human or an animal or or something like that. Uh, there are at least, I believe, it's 16 uh, across the country. So Tanzania has quite a few more petroglyph sites than has been recognized. Not only does it have more petroglyph sites than recognized, it also has uh, significantly more than neighboring countries of Eastern Africa. And one of the issues that I was thinking about was just how far to go with this literature review. It seems to be the case that Tanzania also has more known petroglyph sites than most other nations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one of the challenges of trying to put together this kind of a database is that uh, I quickly began to realize that there are many rock art specialists and archaeologists who are aware of sites, but who have not published them. And also there are quite a few sites that are mentioned in travel guides or on websites and things like that that have not been uh, published in peer-reviewed articles. So, uh, and and then also there's an issue of naming and and coordinates are not often included. So there's been quite a lot of work that I had to do to sort of figure out uh, which sites are being referred to in all these different kinds of locations. So um, this, I think, is due to a number of reasons. One might be, as I'll talk about in a, in a moment, an overly narrow definition of what uh, what a petroglyph is. Uh, it might also relate to the history of rock art and research, rock art research in Tanzania, which has tended to focus on Kondoa, although in recent years, uh, there have been many folks who have started to do rock art surveys beyond Kondoa and have uh, located a number of both uh, uh, pictograph, which would be paintings and petroglyph or en engraving sites. Um, also, and this sounds really basic, but I really think it's true, is... Uh, the digitization of uh, academic journals has really uh, assisted considerably because one thing I was surprised by is really just the range of journals that some of these, especially older articles that mentioned uh, petroglyphs were in. So another key point that I'm trying to communicate in this article is that uh, rock art study, this is this is not my observation, uh, but it is it is also, uh, it's not an original observation of mine. Others have mentioned this, but rock art studies in Africa, including in Tanzania, uh, have often emphasized authorship. So uh, trying to understand which present group or the ancestors of which present group uh, produced the, the images, whether they're engravings or paintings. And in Tanzania, uh, this kind of an approach has tended to be informed by and also re reinforces uh, cultural historical sequences that uh, have tended to emphasize uh, distinct ethnic and linguistic communities and also uh, subsistence systems. So many of you will probably be familiar with this, but some of the dominant categories in the historiography for this region deal with categories like Khoisan, Bantu, Cushitic, those tend to be mapped on to categories like forager, farmer, pastoralist. And within Tanzania, you often, often also see a correlation between those groups and rock art traditions. Like in Kondoa, we have the naturalistic tradition, the white tradition, and the cattle tradition. Um, and there's certainly benefit to those kinds of approaches. But one of the things that, that I've started to realize is that they only take you so far, and there are certain kinds of questions they don't allow you to, to actually uh, explore. Uh, so another realization uh, that came out of, of, of this project is that uh, Tanzania's rock art is thought to form two zones, one in Kondoa district, one around Lake Victoria. These zones are thought to indicate the past presence of two distinct forager populations, so uh, ancestral Twa groups and Khoisan-speaking groups. But um, based on my own fieldwork and, and the fieldwork of others in recent years, 
it does seem as if there's much more overlap between those two zones than had uh, previous been, previously been realized. So there are both pictographs and petroglyphs and cave drums, which I've talked about to this group before, that exists in the space across those two zones. And um, one of the realizations that I had is that, well, that the sense that there are two distinct zones could actually be an artifact of the history of fieldwork as much as um, something about actual past social histories. But when I started thinking about uh, the sites within their um, sort of how the sites are located on the landscape and the kinds of past and present associations with those sites, uh, I realized that there's more than just a, a spatial trend uh, suggesting connections between these two, two areas. And there's other kinds of evidence to suggest similar social histories. So um, one thing that I'm I'm working through, and especially I'm I'm I want to develop maps and and better sort of visualizations of this, is that there does seem to be a recurring association between uh, petroglyphs and sites associated in some way with well-being. And so I'll talk about that a bit more later. But many petroglyph sites are associated uh, near rock shelters. And I began to realize that uh, it could be, for example, that the sounds produced uh, through sounds produced or food produced um, through these petroglyphs or the petroglyphs could have been created sort of as a byproduct of, of some of those kinds of activities may have been very important uh, for the use of these sites. And also uh, approaches that emphasize authorship um, have difficulty thinking about the reuse and resignification of sites on the landscape. And I think that petroglyphs provide another way to begin thinking about how many different groups through time may have um, uh, constructed meaningful uh, spaces and places. Um, and as a just a quick bit of background about my research, uh, I've spoken in this group before, so many of you probably already know this. Uh, I had previously done uh, ethnographic work uh, with the Sandawe, and the Sandawe homeland is, is located a couple of hours north of Dodoma, about an hour east of Sangita, about an hour west of Kondoa. And I increasingly became uh, interested in the history, longer term histories of the region. And so uh, my after the ethnographic work, which focused on wild plant use, uh, my master's paper actually asked this question of, well, how did it come to be that the Sandawe were categorized as, as hunter-gatherers and what kinds of implications has, ha has this had for how and why anthropologists and other social scientists um, have been interested in uh, this group and their, their histories? And um, the master's paper ended up being an exploration of the history of the term Khoisan. So how did it emerge uh, in the Southern African context? What kinds of data did it describe? It actually emerged as a um, term in physical anthropology, but then was used to describe uh, um, <clears throat> other aspects of cultural life in Southern Africa among uh, groups that rely to varying extents on uh, hunting and gathering. It became a linguistic category. Uh, to describe the languages in that region. And then I also trace the history of how that term was applied to East Africa. And <clears throat> one of the things I considered in that paper is both how it allows us to understand certain things about the history of namely the Sandawe and the Hadza, but also the kinds of uh, historical trajectories that it, it was preventing us from being able to see. So for my... Uh, uh, doctoral work, I decided to then turn towards archaeology. It's not that I think archaeology is any better than any other historically oriented form of research, but it was a line of evidence that we had relatively little of from this region. And there had been uh, there had been uh, quite a few hypotheses that had been put forward about the history of the inhabitants of, of what's now the Sandawe homeland over the long term. And I realized that I could begin explore those uh, really quite directly with some archaeological evidence. So the map on the left is is just a, a map of <clears throat> where I did archaeological survey, and it shows some of the open air sites, which means sites just out on the landscape, and rock shelter sites uh, that we recorded over two seasons of fieldwork. 
and a couple of pictures of some of the kinds of objects that we found. So um, lots of ostrich eggshell bead, which is quite interesting. One really amazing thing about the ostrich eggshell is that um, we've done radiocarbon work on, on that. And there's one site in particular where many of those beads uh, and blanks, so the fragments of shell that the beads were made out of, uh, exceed the radiocarbon limit, which means that they could be um, as old or older than 50,000 years. Uh, there's a piece of, we found a few pieces of obsidian. Uh, so that black, uh, uh, little black flake uh, up in the left corner of that picture. We were able to do chemical analysis of that. And uh, that appears to have come from central Kenya. And <clears throat> which is interesting because um, that represents about a 30% increase uh, in the distance over which we know obsidian was being transported in Eastern Africa. Uh, and then there's a cowrie shell bead and a glass bead there on the bottom. And about a third of the glass beads that we found uh, came from uh, production sites in South Asia. And some of about a third of them also date, could potentially date to the 1500s. So um, <clears throat> one of the realizations that I started to have over the course of doing the fieldwork is uh, many of the hypotheses about the about this region were that it, for various sort of environmental and cultural reasons, was relatively isolated until somewhere between the 1600s and 1800s, and that it was really in the latter half of the 1800s that population growth forced uh, um, the hunter-gatherers living in this in this area to begin uh, um, experimenting more or adopting uh, more uh, heavily uh, food production, so agriculture and, and pastoralism. But um, the archaeological evidence actually tells very different kinds of stories over much longer uh, timelines. And as you can see from the bottom, we have direct evidence of uh, iron production in this area dating to 350 AD, uh, which is, you know, at least a thousand years older than <laughs> what people were thinking about for the reason uh, for the for the region. Um, so really just a remarkable set of archaeological assemblages. And uh, among the things that we recorded were all of these really interesting petroglyph sites. And one thing that I'll say is there were there were um, a couple of sites that have been recorded previously. And so the first one i'll I'll talk to you about is called Tambala. And Tambala was first recorded by the Cole Larsons in the 1930s. And over the course of fieldwork, we were able to, I'm fairly certain that we relocated the site. Um, but there are some notable differences. So, <clears throat> and one thing I'll say too, as you'll see over the next few slides, partly because I'm uh, not a rock art specialist and uh, a lot of the pictures aren't very good. And so one of the things we really struggled with was how to uh, get photographs of some of these engravings and because it's very hard to see them in bright sunlight. And so we were speaking with Benjamin Smith, who's uh, a rock art specialist uh, based in Australia. And he suggested we go back at night with a flashlight and hold it obliquely. And so the pictures that you'll see of this site were all that we took from the evening. So one of probably before I actually publish this article, we'll need to find somebody uh, to accompany us to revisit all of the sites and take better photographs. So you'll have to forgive me on, on the, the photographs. Some of them, we just didn't take, somehow managed to not take photographs of. So in those situations, I have um, some of the sketches that I took. So <clears throat> the Tambala site, uh, when the Cole Larsons first, uh, first described it in the 1930s, uh, they mention seven or eight engraved motifs, motifs at this site. We found about 16. Uh, I'll, I can offer some speculation about what's going on, but one of the things that I tried to do was, was to pair up images of the motifs that we found with the illustrations and the photographs that they provided. And based on that, I'm fairly confident that we found the site, but there are quite a few differences. So for example, just a, a, a real quick glance at the image on the left versus the image on the right. They look quite similar, but I think that if this is in fact the same motif, I think that at some point between fieldwork and publication of the Cole Larson's work, that their image got transposed somehow um, because uh, 
this sort of backwards three shape if you were to flip it so that it's coming out of the of the same part of the spiral that the motif is in the picture on the right then other aspects of this of the spiral are actually not quite right so and it but i'm not going to walk everybody through it but i have done it where i've tried to like rotate them and map them on and and there's some differences but it's such a distinctive motif but i think that at some point maybe something got transposed uh this is another motif where we tried to link up a, a, a motif that we observed at that site with a former illustration. That one's a little more straightforward. This one's especially hard to see in the image on the right, uh, but it's quite a large spiral. And then um, this site, there's actually quite a bit of damage uh, it's an open air site, so it's exposed to the elements, and the top layer of rock has begun has begun to um, flake off, which is sometimes called spalling. But I think that sort of by process of elimination, that the illustration on the left matches the image on the right. Uh, this is a motif that we recorded that. Uh, does not seem to have been mentioned in any of the Cole Larson's publications or illustrated in any way. I don't know the extent to which all of you can see it on your own screens, but. Um, <clears throat> and then what was interesting, this is also difficult to see, like I said, we really need to go back and, and take better photographs, but the site is on top of a very large boulder and all of the the engraved motifs that the Cole Larson's mention are at one end of the boulder. At the other end of the boulder, we found um, about eight of these circles that have a bar that go through the middle. They're also really quite eroded. So I think that there are a few things that could have happened. One, it's possible that a portion of the boulder was buried when the Cole Larson's were there or was covered in vegetation and they simply didn't see it. It's also possible that um, this was engraved in the meantime, and that um, erosion is just working really quickly, and that these sites are actually uh, uh, fading away really quite rapidly. Uh, I think we'd probably need uh, to get a specialist out there to look at them, both to figure out what's going on in terms of potentially their age, but also in terms of how to how to best protect these sites. Uh, another site which I don't have a good photograph of, but I'm using an illustration from Ten Ra from 1974. The Colosse D site uh, is a motif uh, that appears to be an iron hoe. Um, I agree with Ten Ra. One of the things that he said when he visited the site was that it could be a, a natural erosional feature. And several rock art specialists have have commented on the fact that with petroglyphs, you can often see microscopically if you were to take out a, uh, hand lenses or small microscopes that you can that you can see um, damage to the crystal structure of the rock that help you to determine if it's erosional or if it was produced through grinding or pecking or something like that. So um, this was another site that we relocated, relocated, but again, I think that we would need to do additional analyses to, to confirm that it is actually a petroglyph. Um, this is another site that was, so this is one of the sites that was newly recorded during fieldwork. And uh, one of the things that, that I learned is that it is very common for, um, it's very common for, people to associate petroglyph sites with human footprints. And this is not just in East Africa, this is all across Africa. And over the course of doing fieldwork, we we held a lot of meetings with uh, local residents and many of them mentioned footprint sites. And this was one such site. So when we went to the site, what was really interesting about it was uh, to me, what, what the folks who went with this were referring to as, as footprints seemed to me to be erosional features sort of like pockmarks that were on this inselberg up above these engraved motifs. And it was as we were looking around that somebody <laughs> somebody noticed them and said, oh, and there's also these. Have you ever noticed these before? And um, and so these are some engraved spirals, I think at least probably four 
uh, but two of them have been eroded or damaged in some way. And I have been communicating with Emmanuel Boisiri about this site uh, because it's located uh, near the Bubu River and it's in the flood zone of uh, a dam that is uh, being constructed along that river. So um, we've been talking about uh, getting him out there to do um, uh, some reconnaissance to see if the site could could be preserved uh, in C2. It's probably too big uh, to be removed. It's it's on a, uh, like I mentioned, it's on a, a large Inselberg. So not exactly something that you could relocate very easily. But there is a possibility that it could be, it could have a uh, surface uh, placed over it to protect it from, from water. Uh, another site is called uh, Handawa, and Handawa is located in a, in a rock shelter that is actively used uh, for um, rituals related to fertility and well-being. Uh, this site I uh, have mentioned before to this group, it also contains uh, cave drums. And below the cave drums on a vertical uh, rock surface are these uh, indentations. At first, I thought they were natural, but as I was reading about petroglyphs, it is apparently the case that uh, there are almost no known geological processes that create these kinds of indentations on vertical rock surfaces. There are a couple, but they're highly, they happen under highly specific conditions. So most rock art specialists consider these kinds of hollows or cupules that you find on, on vertical surfaces to have been uh, anthropogenic, to have been made by humans. And this site uh, contains six of these. And you can tell from the picture up here that, it, that they may have been buried at one point and then um, the dirt washed away. Another site, again, that I don't have a great picture of, uh, but is really quite interesting is, is uh, Segegela. And what's especially interesting about Segegela is that there's a boulder in the rock shelter that has um, two rows of cupules. And those cupules could have been a bow board or a lithophone, which is a rock gong. It's basically an indentation that when you hit it, it causes a, a ringing. Uh, what's especially notice, noticeable to me about this site is there is a recurring motif across the length of the site, which is it it appears to be um, either a giraffe with a very long neck or an antelope-headed snake or giraffe-headed snake. And so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up here at the top, um, we have this sort of snake-like motif with giraffe-like uh horns or antlers up there on top. And we there's no head in this one, but you can also see another one of those bodies. And these were both covered with dots. And on the next slide, again, you can see this kind of a, a snake-like figure. Uh, what's really interesting about that is um, in Southern Africa, and especially Namibia, there are motifs like this, and they have been um, in one, in one area in particular, they've been studying and it's thought that they represent uh, mediation or travel between uh, this realm and sort of a, a, a spiritual realm. And then there's an, a final site, which I don't have a picture of, called Msembre. And Msembre has a smooth surface a couple of meters above the rock shelter floor. And that rock shelter site also has some uh, rock paintings of a couple of different styles. And it appears that it was smoothed in some way. So whether that was with a rock or with metal, it's unclear. Uh, so that's just a really quick overview of the sites themselves. When I started counting up the number of petroglyph sites, I was really quite uh, surprised. So I had seen uh, all of these references in the literature basically saying, you know, Tanzania has a lot of paintings but very few engravings. So many pictographs, very few petroglyphs. And the sites that mention that, they oftentimes, most of those, most publications that mention Tanzania's rare petroglyphs don't mention the sites themselves. So one thing I decided to do was actually start building a database of the sites. And that's when it started to become uh, quickly apparent to me that there were more than we realized. So Kenya has about 13 
sites. I actually think this number will grow a bit because I've recently come across a lot of travel guides that mention um, lithophones or rock gongs and, and bow boards. So this number, that number will increase for Kenya. Um, <clears throat> Uganda also has about 13 petroglyph sites that have been reported. Tanzania, however, has 59, as far as I can tell. Um, about eight of those, the details are a little sketchy. Uh, they, they're either word of mouth reports or um, there's disagreement in the literature about whether it's uh, anthropogenic or erosional. Of the 59, uh, <clears throat> did I do my math right? Uh, yes. Uh, of the 59, about 17 are figurative, so they seem to represent, uh, they either are some sort of a geometric pattern or they uh, represent an animal or something like that. And then we have a, about 34 sites where we have these hollows or cupules or other kinds of features that don't seem to be figurative, but, and so some scholars might not consider them to be heteroglyphs, but part of my argument is that they should be. And I also, since both of those synthetic reports were written in 1986, I split uh, the literature by the sites that we knew about before 19, or that had been reported before 1986 and those that have been reported since. So there were already a lot known by the 80s. And also we found quite a few and have begun reporting on quite a few sites since 1986. So really pretty remarkable. Um, and I'll come, I'll, I'll leave this up for a minute. So so those are the sites themselves. And just for the sake of time, since we're already at 835, I'll, I'll talk over this fairly briefly. Um, as I mentioned, most rock art studies in Tanzania have focused on the pictographs or the paintings. Some of that has to do with the fact that there really are just a lot more sites. So although we have at least about 60 petroglyph sites in Tanzania, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, rock painting sites in Tanzania. And the approach to those, um, early approaches to those were really quite a mess. So scholars had a hard time making sense of the diversity. But one thing that you notice in the literature over and over is that there's a tendency to ascribe uh, certain of the rock art to hunter-gatherer groups and some of the rock art group to farmers and pastoralists. And that's been done uh, uh, to varying degrees of, um, how should I say this, robustness. So probably the most robust study uh, came out in 2015, and it was uh, published by Emmanuel Boissiri, a colleague of mine, and uh, Benjamin Smith. And they were focusing on Kondoa and were doing statistical analyses of, 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 the, of the rock paintings and using things like superposition, so looking at which style is painted on top of which other style, that gives you a sense of which came before. And they argue that Kondoa, at least, contains three traditions, and each of those traditions drawing on uh, uh, eth uh, ethnographic and historical data can be associated with three different uh, communities that currently inhabit Kondoa or live in the, live in the nearby area. One of the things that I started to realize as I was revisiting some of the rock art that had been some of the pictographs and paintings that had been recorded in the Sindawi homeland is there seem to be different kinds of trends happening in the Sindawi homeland. So, for example, in Kondoa, you very rarely see animals painted with white pigment. But in the Sindawi homeland, there's actually quite a few uh, pictographs with white pigment. So. Uh, I think that the the study that Emmanuel and Benjamin did is is convincing, but I also think that there's probably more diversity, even very close to Kondoa. And so there becomes this question of um, how do we continue to try to maintain some sort of order in our categorization of these sites while also being open to the possibility that there is more diversity? And how do we make sense of that diversity? Uh, because the, as one example, the, the um, naturalistic or uh, red, often red paintings in Kondoa that have been associated with foragers have also been associated with ancestral Sandawe, <clears throat> but the pictographs in the Sandawe homeland actually appear to be um, made in using different techniques and different kinds of pigments and, and 
so it's sort of been presumed that there's sort of a coherent tradition, but I actually think there's quite a bit of diversity across it. So that's one thing I'm still working through in some of my other research is thinking about how do we how do we impose order while also being open to the fact that the diversity that exists could actually point to other kinds of um, pasts. Uh, another issue that I've been grappling with is that there, as I mentioned, there is debate about what counts as a petroglyph. And I want to read, <clears throat> I want to read the definition that um, a rock art scholar with the last name of Bednarik proposes. And he says that, um, I don't want to read too much directly, uh, but he says uh, that there are three criteria for distinguishing cultural from natural cupules. So these sort of cup-shaped, what oftentimes get referred to as grinding hollows in Tanzania. So the first, the cupule must have been made by the human hand, obvious enough. Uh, evidence of the cupule's production must be visible microscopically and macroscopi macroscopically. And three, the cupule must have been made intentionally, and it is expected to possess some non-utilitarian or symbolic function, even though its production may have involved utilitarian dimensions. And, um, and at first I thought, okay, I could get on board with that. But then as I thought about it more and read some of Bednarik's other writings, he seems to, in some cases, reject purely utilitarian uh, markings on rocks uh, he he seems to reject some of those as petroglyphs. So, for example, he uh, would seem to, and I need to get in touch with him to confirm, uh, would seem to, in, in many cases, uh, not count grinding mortars that are in massive rocks on a boulder or game boards like a bow board as petroglyphs because those are utilitarian and not symbolic. But one of the things that I started thinking about is that many of these petroglyphs so a grinding hollow, for example, may not itself have been symbolic. The grinding hollow wasn't necessarily intended to represent anything. It was a byproduct of the goal of, of grinding possibly grain. But uh, you can still nonetheless infer things about cultural activity from those kinds of markings. And so for me, I'm less inclined to not include those as petroglyphs, especially because uh, as I said, once I started doing this um, literature review and thinking about where all these petroglyphs are located and, and the sites in which they're located, there does seem to be a recurring association, especially in Lake Victoria, but also in central Tanzania, between petroglyphs and these sites that we know um, from uh, ethnographic or oral historical or even in some cases archaeological work were associated with ritual activity related to well-being. So. Um, I'll I'll try to start wrapping it up. But basically, where I'm going with the article is to say, is just to make it known how many sites there are, but also to say, if we have this more expansive view of petroglyphs, uh, that it allows us to um, stop worrying so much about this distinction between symbolic or non-symbolic. And uh, by thinking about the sites within their immediate material, and to the extent that we can understand this, their cultural milieu, that we can actually begin to understand um, how these petroglyphs were involved with the creation and maintenance of meaningful spaces and how those kinds of approaches might be informed by, but also sort of approach the question from a different angle than this question of authorship. And so, and the reason that I think this might be interesting to some of the Rift Valley Network folks is because I think your linguistic research has also um, demonstrated the extent of uh, interaction across groups uh, which sort of works against these histories that emphasize the migration and replacement of groups. And so um, I think there's a lot left uh, that could be gleaned from uh, exploring these sites from new angles. So I'll leave it there if anybody would like to ask some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that is also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. 
Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. All right, I will start with a question while other people are gathering their sure. thoughts. So I'm not very familiar with this idea of authorship, and I wondered if you could elaborate about that a little bit. One of the approaches that has been longstanding in, in Rockard studies is to is basically to do different kinds of typological studies of pictographs to say, are there recurring, are there recurring sorts of forms of production? So, or use of pigments or particular styles that indicate there was that these were being produced by um, either individuals or communities that had some sort of a consistent, I don't know if you, I mean, we could probably think of them as like now we might want to, a term we might want to use is something like a community of practice, but was there some sort of, are these indicative of some sort of like commonly shared set of ideas, whether that's among an individual or small group of individuals or an entire group. But the idea has been that any sort of recurring style that we see somehow indicates the presence of some sort of cohesive cultural group. And you could do a, a taxonomic or a stylistic study like that and not make any assumptions that it that it gets linked to particular groups. But there is often an, a, an assumption, sometimes actually quite explicit, that any sort of um, recurring style that you see is associated with some sort of cultural identity. And um, in Southern Africa and also Eastern Africa, you do see sort of a tendency to try to link up particular styles of rock art with either present day groups that might be still be making rock art or with ancestral groups of contemporary populations. So um, in, in Kondoa, for example, a lot of the red paintings are thought to have been made by ancestral for ancestral forager populations, not necessarily by contemporary Sandawe, but ancestral uh, Sandawe. The what are sometimes called the late whites uh, are thought to have been associated with um, some of the uh, Bantu speaking agro pastoral groups. And then there are there's this other tradition um, often made in black pigments, often representing uh, cattle and humans that are thought to have been made by um, uh, ancestral Maasai groups. So um, you can't necessarily link up all rock art to existing groups. So one example of that in Lake Victoria, this is one, one case where many of the paintings in the Lake Victoria basin uh, include different kinds of geometric designs, especially uh, circles that kind of look like sunburst or spirals. And by association with other regions of the continent, uh, it's thought that those were made by uh, ancient uh, an ancient forager population that may have been like Twa communities, but there are no such communities in Tanzania, for example, where those paintings exist. So that's one situation where there's understood to be a coherent style, but that style can't be linked to a contemporary group. There's also situations where we can see coherent styles and there doesn't seem to be any sort of relationship to contemporary groups, if that makes sense. So, so Tembi Russell and Purity Kira have pointed out some potential relationships between some Kenyan rock art and livestock brands. Mm -hmm. And then Gerhard Kubik has some stuff. It's more Angola-based, but he had a couple of symbolic uses in Tanzania, like, you know, like face painting and divination, that sort of thing. Um, he, he's done some work on rock art in Angola. So I, I just haven't seen very much about like these sort of connections in Tanzania, whether, well, let me see what the other, he, he said uh, that their tattooed and card ideographs among Makonde were one of these, well, that's Mozambique, but also Tanzania and a tattooed ideographic facial marks among the Pangwa indicating religious attachment. He, this is just an overview of African graphic systems. So th just this question of how many of these, um, images have sort of carried on into present day use. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering what more we might know about that in Tanzania. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I I uh, didn't talk about it during the presentation because I wanted to leave time for Q&A. One thing that I started to do was 
was look around to say, okay, and this was not just for the petroglyphs, but also for the pictographs of the paintings. I started to to look around for stylistic similarities. And there are regions of Eastern and Southern Africa where I can, you know, I, I think that there are some stylistic similarities, but I don't really feel comfortable sort of making some sort of claim about a connection between these regions because there's so much geographic distance. There's so much distance between them. And archaeologically, there's no evidence of, of other forms of connection. So there are some similarities between some of those, uh, uh, some of the the petroglyphs at Tambala, so that site the, that the Kolarsons recorded and that we relocated, and the um, sites in northern Kenya where it's thought that some of these petroglyphs might be cattle brands. But we really don't understand the the history of the spread of pastoralism and presuming that uh, that like even if we were to presume that that's what these are uh, and that it's some sort of a link, there's really not good archaeological evidence over the timelines that might might be involved. So it's like you could you could and also some of them are like circles and spirals, which is a sort of recurring motif you see all around the world and seemingly through time. So. It's like, yeah, there's a similarity, but what does that similarity mean? Does it actually indicate some sort of uh, some sort of cultural connection between these two regions or not? Another place where there does seem to be some similarities between the petroglyphs and the pictographs is um, uh, from this part of Tanzania is Namibia. There's some there's some petroglyphs in Namibia. Um, that are thought to have been produced by foraging populations that do resemble some of the petroglyphs here. Now, of course, people have been interested in that in a potential uh, of a of a relationship between these two regions for a long time because of the Sindawa and some of the um, uh, linguistic communities in Namibia. But again, archaeologically, it's so you can you can sort of point towards a potential linguistic connection. You could point towards this potentially rock art connection. But it's like, are there are there is there other evidence of of connections between these two these two you know widely dispersed regions that actually sort of make sense uh, in terms of and like chronologies and everything else? So and rock art's also really hard to date. That's another problem with studying this is that pictographs you can date them if well people have been developing new methods to date them, but pictographs because they're made with pigment sometimes the pigment is datable. So if you use charcoal for example, you could potentially date it. Uh, I believe people have been experimenting with with dating rock art based on um, uh, dating the mineral deposits that build up over them is one method that I've heard. Sometimes if you find pictographs or petroglyphs in excavated context, you can sort of infer the age. But if you just have um, a petroglyph like on an open air site, there's really no way it's very, I think it, I don't. I'm not really aware of very many ways to date that. So then you also have, and this is one, this is one thing that I think actually prevents some conversation between rock art specialists and archaeologists is that uh, I think some archaeologists might be disinterested in really talking about things like petroglyphs because it's it's like, yes, it's evidence of the past, but it's evidence of the past that you can't put in time. You can put it in in space, but you can't put it in time. And archaeologists want to be able to do both. Um, and then the, one of the challenges that rock art specialists have is they've developed all sorts of techniques to, um, to understand the production and the, you know, the stylistic trends. Um, but the chronology is often very difficult. So there are these really, so all that to say, like, thank you for these. I'm going to look in, I'm going to look into these. I have read some of the work, especially from Northern Kenya and the relationship to, uh, cattle brands and there do seem to be some similarities but i certainly wouldn't feel comfortable you know making some sort of claim that like oh the petroglyphs in the sandawi homeland must have been made by similar communities as those in northern kenya or or at you know or by forager communities in namibia and partly is because it you know you you see these kinds of superficial resemblances, but even both of those situations, you'd end up with a very different kind of social history. So in one case, it's like, if you want to claim there's a relationship with Northern Kenya, then it becomes this like history of pastoral communities. And if you want to emphasize the relationship with Namibia, it's sort of a history of foraging communities. And it's like, well, those are 
those are probably going to point towards very different kinds of social processes and and different timelines. So, yeah, the the issue of chronology really complicates efforts. Well, to I guess to my that. question was really more the, this imagery that is on mm -hmm. bodies and is not on rocks yeah. and things tends to get ignored. It seems like, uh -huh. and so I, and when you're talking about social histories, I just think that mm -hmm. that that's a pretty cool yeah. angle. So one thing that I should look into a little more is Tenra, you probably are aware of had, I mean, maybe we've even talked about this. Um, he had- Yeah, I was just trying to done, find it just now. <laughs> yeah, had done on the forehead tattooing. Right, right. I just couldn't remember which. Um, yeah, and it would be interesting to see if there's a relationship between any of the, the tattoos that he recorded and any of the, pictographs and petroglyphs. One thing that's really interesting is there there are some paintings that <clears throat> are actually there there is some similarity there is some between the pictographs and petroglyphs some of them use the same kinds of shapes. Um so it would be interesting to look at Ten Ra's work and see if there's any any potential connection there. So especially if those those barred circles the circle with the line through it that could be interesting to look into so what are some of the you know conservation concerns that you run into with petroglyphs and yeah I mean what do you think are some of the next steps you know we talk a lot about digitizing um and you've you've had your fair share of problems <laughs> trying to photograph things at night so you, you clearly thought about this so I'm just curious if you have thoughts on um, you know, there's the Trust for African Rock Art, and they have 40 years of digital rock art records. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, you know, how how are we moving forward with preserving those digital data? Those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. So I'm curious yeah. what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's really great. So, um, <clears throat> so something in the near term that would be very easy to do would be to work with colleagues to just even revisit the sites and record them properly. Uh, but I do think you raise a, a really good question about then what? Um, certainly in the case of Mano Mano Say, uh, one of the reasons I got in touch with Emmanuel about that is because there's there's an immediate risk to that site. Uh, what's I mean, the risk? It, 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 what's that? What's the risk? Uh, it's going to be In, underwater. Underwater, okay. Yeah. Um, but the open air sites... I mean, it either it either speaks to the age of the petroglyphs or it speaks to just how quickly the material erodes. But the open air sites are, I mean, especially Tambala, um, major erosion on the surface that the motifs are are engraved in. Um, that one's relatively accessible. Uh, it's pretty close to a to a track. So in terms of in terms of logistics, that one might be sort of ideal for sort of uh, preservation efforts of different kinds. Um, one thing that came up came up during conversations is a lot of the folks uh, who live in Usandawe would would really like, and I know there's there's pros and cons to this, but a lot of the folks who who live in that area would like to um, would like to develop cultural tourism around some of these sites um, because they, you know, they they're aware of, and many of them have been to the sites in Kondoa. And one thing that was commented upon to me was they were like, you know, they always talk about how all those sites were made by our ancestors. And they're like, but we're here. <laughs> and, and so um, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, if it would be possible and, and uh, to build like another museum or, you know, sort of extend some of those, some of those resources uh, into the Sandawi homeland. But you know, access to a lot of the sites is hard. So one thing that I tried to do when I was recording the sites is when I visited each site, I I did try to record, um, I, and this was based off of conversations with with uh, some of my colleagues, especially in the local governments, was, um, are there any obvious and active risks to the sites? And are there any of the sites that would be, you know, if we had good sort of practices, that would be especially good for um, uh, cultural tourism. So 
are they interesting and why are they interesting and are they easy to access um, or not? Just to try to give a sense of, of what the possibilities, but also the limitations are on the sites. So I've got that information and I've you know been sharing that information uh, with folks, but how to actually implement it is this next question, because of course that takes, you know, time and money and commitment. Um, but even the petroglyphs inside the rock shelters aren't just because the petroglyph is inside a rock shelter doesn't necessarily mean it's protected. So at Segegela, the one where there's a row, a couple rows of those small cupule shapes, uh, and that's the one that has the the possible like giraffe snake. Yeah. Um, that rock shelter is uh, very close to an agricultural field, and there's a lot of soot and smoke damage. So a lot of the same, you know, kinds of risks that we know about at sites in the Kondoya area are also present here very much so. So hmm. I don't know. And then I'm sure there's, you know, a public education component that could be involved, but there's also, you know, a massive risk of um, destruction of those sites from things like um, treasure hunting and things like that. So the sites face a lot of, there's a, there's a whole host of risks that are active and ongoing with these sites but mano mano say is like very much an active risk of destruction so yeah so during conversations with folks there were actually six more sites that were listed as containing footprints but that we didn't have time to visit so when i go back i want to make time to go to the sites because there were four that were mentioned to me i guess there were about 10 total that were mentioned as possibly containing footprints and i visited four and of the four, half of them had engraved motifs. And I'm like, 50% is a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good uh, rate, actually. So um, I'd, I'd like to go uh, visit the other sites because I suspect some of them probably, probably do have engraved motifs. And there were other sites that were listed as, that people know of as being rock gongs. So those likely have petroglyphs as well. So there's, there's a lot more out there. Um, yeah, there's, just, there's also a, a site that this is, this is what I was talking about. Like when I started to read, <clears throat> dig into literature and I realized, oh my goodness. Um, uh, there is another site that was reported by word of mouth to Fossbrook and that in the Sandawe homeland near the town of Curio, which is a little South of Quam Toro. And, um, it's, it was mentioned by word of mouth to Fosbrook, and then Fosbrook mentions it as an aside in uh, his booklet that he developed for the Kondoa rock art in the 50s, which is a little guidebook to the rock art. And yeah, there's I know that one, yeah. this mm -hmm. random site in Usandawe that gets mentioned, but I wasn't able to figure out where it is and if I could get there. You know, having seen pastoralists out there watching their herds, right? It's you're out there for hours, you're bored. I can imagine sitting there pecking on a rock just to <laughs> ease the boredom. So has anybody looked at the sites with that specifically in mind? Like where you can stand and watch your herd, but you're not so far up a hill that you can't run down and actually help them when mm -hmm. they need help. You know, something where this really makes sense for somebody in that situation be, to be doing. Yeah. Um I think that's great. And that's certainly something we could do, but it, I mean, it, I think it would entail uh, revisiting the sites from this kind of an approach of trying to. Yeah, because I can't see site. on top of a hill and watching your cattle, right? Or yeah. your sheep or whatever. Right. And so it would be kind of like Imogene Lim's though. study, which was this site oriented approach. So she was thinking about how rock shelters, not necessarily shelters that have rock art, just rock shelters that were being inhabited in any way related to uh, the landscape. And one of the things, and so she looked at things like elevation, relative elevation of, of the site, sort of where they are on the slopes. Are they at the top? Are they in the middle, at the bottom? Um, and that kind of information has not, I would not be able to glean that from literature review. That would, that would require going out and revisiting the sites and and like I said, with that kind of a question, a question in mind. And then kind of um, related, but it might, and you know, I'm really not a rock art expert, right? I'm a linguist, but it seemed like a lot of this stuff in Southern Africa, when they have the engravings, it's because they have lots of boulders and they don't have the kind of sites where you'd 
paint right mm -hmm. so is there but it doesn't seem like that really works for tanzania right like you have places that you could paint so you're not engraving because that's the only kind of surfaces you have right right yeah i've seen i have seen this argument that you know you and i think broadly it you know this is true that in order to have rock art you need to have exposed rock and it's, if you want to have old rock art you need to have exposed rock that has sort of protected spaces because otherwise it might just be it might fade or be destroyed uh, over time and you know tanzania is very mountainous and there's just also just a lot of places that haven't where there haven't been systematic surveys of the rock art so uh like i mentioned in that one slide i think that our sense of there is some real institutional and sort of historical trajectories behind where people decide to do this kind of work in, in Tanzania. And so I think it sort of reinforces the idea that the rock art only exists in one place. But it, you know, from talking to colleagues of mine, not just um, Itambu, but others who are working down by Oringa, it's like, if you actually spend time and start doing a survey, you start finding sites. So I think that um, there are sites probably all over Tanzania that we don't know about yet. Uh, but but yes, I think I think that's a great question. Uh, and but it would entail sort of approaching the sites from that direction. So rather than just thinking about the motif itself, thinking about the the larger context in which we find it. Uh, and it's only if we explicitly are gathering that data that we can then start to see the trends. One of the challenges that I'm having with putting together even just some of the visualizations is um, some articles mention coordinates for the sites, but a lot of them don't. And uh, so there's a lot of sites, especially around the mid 19, early to mid 1900s, where what I get are this petroglyph is located. Uh, if you walk 300 meters north of this particular hotel and then run into the stream and go 200 meters to the to the south, <laughs> you'll find mm -hmm. the petroglyph. So we could, you know, we could relocate the sites, but it, I don't, you know, in most situations, we don't actually know. We have a general idea of where they are. But we don't really know where they are, which makes it difficult to then think about um, sort of any trends in terms of site location and things like that. So, but yeah, I think that would be great to do. Uh, and who knows, hopefully, you know, I've, I've been really excited because there are so many people who've been doing uh, rock art survey in Tanzania in recent years. And so hopefully this can keep the fire burning. I just have one Go ahead. minor random question about um those footprints again yeah we talked about um I read a paper and I put it in the chat but I, I I didn't send it maybe you've already read this paper that's linking potentially grindstone like grinding for example millet you know with a big stick mm -hmm. um some of the folks at those sites have said that that's what they thought it was you know some people think it's the footprints oh yeah and that an, an alternative thing you know way that it could have formed is through grinding Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that at a lot of sites where you'll see the cupules and then maybe, you know, like you're saying, like, an, like a petroglyph. So I'm wondering if maybe um, those two things are related and if you've already found, if you've already seen that literature. So I know there's one paper, I think from, I want to say Nigeria, but I'm not sure. Oh, I don't know. I don't, that one doesn't sound familiar, but if you come across it, send it my way. One thing I've become really interested in and I, I don't know much about, but I know that there, I know it's out there. People have been working on this is. I referenced it is uh, thinking about the people who are thinking about the sounds at particular sites. Mm. So um, trying to understand how, like with rock gongs or lithophones. So um, does it seem as if uh, people were trying to purposefully manipulate sound at these sites in particular ways? Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting about the cave drums, for example, is like I said, among the Sindawe, those are almost universally referred to as beehives. But in other places, they are referred to as drums. And the evidence, when you, at least from what I've seen, is that when there is a drum head left, there's often a little hole in the drum head, which would, uh, which would suggest that it was a friction drum. So uh, a string might have been attached to the drum head. And when you pull on it, it creates this booming sound, uh, and which sort of I was just thinking about it. I was like, well, that actually probably is further evidence that these things were related to things like rainmaking. If if there's an association between those sounds and like thunder, for example, mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I want to revisit, especially some of there's 
there's dozens of sites near Lake Victoria uh, where near rock shelters and uh, rock painting sites, uh, near rock shelters with and without rock paintings, I guess I should say, there are um, all of these uh, grinding hollows and it, and, 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 and rock gongs. And so I'm, that's got, what got me thinking, like maybe, uh, maybe the production of food or the production of sound was important. And that that's why you're seeing this sort of, uh, correlation, this co-location of these different kinds of features at these sites. Um, but that's not something that you can really get to by thinking about something like authorship necessarily. You see that in the, in these Karoo en engravings too. There's rock gongs all scattered amongst the boulders with the um. The in which ones? In in this Parkington at all. It's beautiful oh, yeah. photographs in this book. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Matthew again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today and I hope to see you again at our next webinar on Wednesday the 8th of February by Makarios Itambu entitled The Renewed Archaeological Research and New Discoveries in Singida Region, Central Tanzania.